people, investigating, and this is especially true in workers' compensation, investigating the law, understanding what your rights are, because those will impact what you need to investigate. And we'll talk about some examples of that as we go through today. Uh, so there's a couple of seminars and webinars that are available, recorded on our website. They are free. Uh, one is Basics of Workers' Compensation Subrogation and Introduction to Workers' Compensation Subrogation Law. And uh, the second is Advanced Concepts in Workers' Compensation Subrogation, which is sort of the um, advanced version uh, that gets into quite a bit more detail on some of the law and um, uh, the vagaries of the, the 51 different uh, jurisdictions that we have to deal with. Uh, there's also um, this webinar will be put on the uh, uh, curriculum that's on our website as uh, WC 401 Investigation of Work Comp Subrogation. Now, I wanted to take a moment to um, take you to our website. And it's not letting me do that. Um, but what I would urge you to do is go to the www.mwl-law website, click on uh, Seminars and Education, and there you will see the curriculum that we're talking about. I will also make references to a number of references, resources, charts, uh, legal uh, cheat sheets that we have on our website that deal primarily with subrogation. We've always believed that education is the key to successful subrogation. Uh, maybe the proof is in the pudding today with the large turnout. <clears throat> we think that understanding um, the subrogation rights that you have, understanding the law, and understanding the techniques necessary to maximize your subrogation will uh, assist and lead to um, greater subrogation recoveries. Subrogation, and, and you, you, it's hard to attend a subrogation seminar or webinar without somebody going on and on about the elements of subrogation and what it means. Uh, but when we talk about investigating work comp subrogation, I think there's something very, very important um, with regard to where, what subrogation is. Because I'll give you a hint. Workers' compensation subrogation really isn't subrogation. We'll talk about the three different types of subrogation, but it's a contractual right of reimbursement. In most states, Wisconsin, for example, has um, reported opinions which basically say your rights of recovery under Section 102.29 of the Wisconsin statutes is not a subrogation right. It is just like the IRS's right to collect taxes or have a, a sort of tax lien. It is a statutory, legislatively supported right to recover money back. It can't be contravened. It can't be upset or minimized or eliminated with equitable doctrines like the Madehole Doctrine or the Common Fund Doctrine. It is simply a statutory right of recovery. And understanding that, I think, uh, gets us a long way. Investigation of work comp subrogation is challenging because it involves not only uh, the, uh, the, the requirement that we recognize subrogation potential and third-party liability, um, but also that we understand how to take action on it. We'll be talking a little bit about both of that. Um, when you investigate work comp subrogation, uh, those of you who uh, do this for a living, your job is twice as hard as the uh, liability claims handler sitting down the hall or in the cubicle to the, to the left of you because you not only have to understand the substantive law of 51 different jurisdictions, you have to understand your subrogation rights in those jurisdictions and how they, how they interplay. And when you get into interstate subrogation, it becomes even more complex. So your ability to assess how likely a recovery is to, um, uh, to be affected is uh, important. Um, and is key. And the only way to do that is to understand how uh, to effectively investigate and pursue third-party liability. Now, elements of subrogation. Uh, this is basic. We've heard it before. But it's important to understand that, that the subrogee, which is the insurance company, has paid an obligation to the subrogor. 
Uh, this subrogee must not volunteer to pay the debt of the subrogor. The subrogee is secondarily, not primarily, liable for the obligation, and the subrogee, subrogor, the insured, will not suffer an injustice if subrogation is allowed. Those are the time-tested um, roots of subrogation, the elements of subrogation. Um, part of my message today, in addition to getting into the investigation, the photography, the the, the tools for subrogation, the the tricks, the the philosophy of subrogation, uh, and investigation of work comp subrogation, we're going to be talking about the underlying um, importance of subrogation because I firmly believe that if you approach subrogation, uh, a workers' compensation subrogation, and the investigation of third-party liability with the mindset that I just have to go out and take a few statements, make a few photographs, put it in the file, and I can move on, um, your results, the end uh, recovery, will reflect that approach. However, if you approach subrogation with the mindset that this is my money, this is not just CNAs, Hartford's, or some TPA working for a client, this is, this is actually, if you approach the, the, the act of investigation with the idea that this was my money that's being spent, um, I think you will approach it somewhat differently. And if you understand that subrogation has societal value uh, in terms of um, holding down uh, insurance premiums and uh, putting the liability on the third-party tortfeasor where it belongs, uh, your, your attitude is different, and I think the results are somewhat different. The origins of subrogation, and I just got done um, uh, talking to uh, some members of the Wisconsin legislature about this, um, subrogation is one of the oldest concepts known to um, jurisprudence. It had its roots, its roots back in, in Roman law, Emperor Hadrian back in the uh, second century uh, AD um, uh, initiated subrogation rights and began to shape the blocks of subrogation with regard to the uh, concept of suretyship. And it came to America through civil law and the common law and the courts of chance, chancery or equity uh, from the British courts. But it, it was formally established in common law in the Magna Carta, and it has a long and storied history. So uh, a lot of trial lawyers, and make no mistake about it, the trial lawyers are no friends of subrogation. And as we'll find out, even some of the insurance, um, uh, some people within the insurance industry are not friends of subrogation, so we're fighting a battle on two fronts in many respects. But subrogation is defined as the substitution of one person in the place of another with reference to a lawful claim or right. And although subrogation is recognized in insurance settings, the right of subrogation can occur in many settings. Anytime one party pays a debt of another, it's simply recognized. It doesn't arise um, uh, by statute, um, although it can but it just occurs, and that's called common law, and that's known as equitable subrogation. Contractual subrogation is, of course, the, the auto policy where your, um, your policy language says that if, you, uh, if the insured makes a recovery from any third-party tortfeasor, that the insurer, the insurance company, the subrogee, is subrogated to the rights of that recovery, and there may be some rights of reimbursement in there. There may be some clause about how the insured will do nothing to prejudice um, the insurer's subrogation rights. There may also be language about attorney's fees or made whole doctrine. But ultimately, it's a, it's a contractual right. That's the second type. And the third type is what we are dealing with today. Statutory subrogation is precisely what workers' compensation is, although, as I've said, it's really statutory uh, reimbursement. It doesn't really hinge on the elements of subrogation. And the purposes of subrogation, when you're investigating these claims, it's nice to have this in mind. You are placing the loss ultimately on the wrongdoer or the tortfeasor who caused the loss in the first place. I had a slip and fall two, two weeks ago down in Illinois involving a, a very serious leg and hip injury. Uh, when a, a woman slipped, a waitress was uh, walking outside with a tray of grease and she slipped on some grease and fell off of the, um, the platform that she was walking on. And the investigator came back to me and said, wow, 
uh, I really didn't realize that my going down there to take a few photos and draw a diagram of this stoop she was on was going to result in a whole new uh, legal adventure. That being, we originally thought there was a placemat that was rolled up and wasn't uh, uh, properly secured, and that's what she tripped on, uh, even though it had, it had some grease on it as well. But what we found out was that the area in which she fell had absolutely no lighting, and that that was a big contributor to the accident. It wasn't in the first report of injury. It wasn't in the, uh, the um, uh, interview the statement taken of the claimant. But when we went down and took some photographs and took some measurements, what we noticed was that there were some uh, light fixtures that had no bulbs in them, no, no floodlights, and the area where she fell was literally completely dark, which was hard to capture with a flash camera, but we were able to get some light readings. And um, had we not gone down there, um, the, 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 case, well, the case looked much different in person than it did in your paper file. And that's another thing to remember is that getting your hands dirty, actually having someone, if not yourself, someone visit the site, take some photographs, um, uh, obtain some evidence, uh, get some contracts, get some pictures. We'll talk about this later. It's a whole different ball game. Uh, the, the file um, looks a lot different on your desk than it does in real life. And many times what you're not seeing is what will prevent you from making a full recovery. So the purposes of subrogation are to place the ultimate loss on the wrongdoer or the tortfeasor where it belongs. It prevents a double recovery, so the insured doesn't recover once with your medical bills and indemnity benefit payments, and then a second time recovering all those, those um, damages back from the tortfeasor. Subrogation keeps insurance premiums low. It returns the excess proceeds of a recovery to the insurer who recycles them into lower premiums and rates. Now that's, um, that's important. And it's a concept that's very hard to get across. I've been working with uh, the National Association of Subrogation Professionals on some anti-subrogation legislation that's out there. Uh, and one of the hardest things to combat is sort of the anti-subrogation mentality. It does not matter if it's auto subrogation, property, health, or workers' compensation. There is a mindset that subrogation is simply another batch of frivolous lawsuits. Uh, there is very little forethought, very little consideration given to the um, societal benefits of subrogation. I'm not going to go into a great uh, detail. On our website, on the left-hand side of the uh, home page, there is uh, a couple of things there. There's um, a link that you can click that's called Societal Benefits of Subrogation. It's nice to have, uh, if you ever need to defend the concept of subrogation to a legislator, to a judge, or to a lawyer, and that could include a trial lawyer who is calling you up and say, you know, arguing about your subrogation rights, that's available to you. The second thing on that home page is in a, there's a red square there, and it's called National Radio, Radio Health Journal. It's a, uh, uh, a radio show that I appeared on. Um, uh, a couple of years ago in which I debated a virtual debate with a South Dakota law professor on the merits of subrogation. He, of course, was vehemently anti-subrogation and is in the pockets of the, um, um, the AAJ, the American Association for Justice, which is the National Trial Lawyers Association. Um, and I, of course, was defending subrogation, and it surrounded the uh, health insurance subrogation claim of Deborah Shanks, a Walmart employee who was tragically injured and catastrophically injured, and um, Walmart was trying to recover their ERISA health insurance lien, and somehow it, it, got, uh, it found its way to the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and there was uh, a lot of uh, murmuring around the country about this strange word that no one really understood what it meant, subrogation. Um, and uh, you know, I think you would find that, find that interesting. Um, if you don't believe in the societal value of subrogation, I think your investigation is going to be uninspired and rote. It's going to be routine. You will lack creativity uh, and lack initiative. And without the creativity and the energy and the imagination, I think you're going to be missing 
most subrogation opportunities other than those clear-cut rear-end cases um, that, that come across our desk occasionally. Um, we'll be talking as we um, uh, go forward here today about the fact that we do deal with a disability. Many of us in this webinar today <clears throat> have a disability, and that disability has been engendered and nurtured within the insurance industry, and it is something I call a defense myopia. It is the concept that has been developed naturally. There's nothing wrong with it. It's normal, but after years and years of seeing um, fraudulent cases, grunters and groaners, malingerers, functional overlay, we've, we've come to the opinion that most of these um, cases involve um, um, frivolous, frivolous actions. And if we carry that mindset over to the subrogation side of our business, of our industry, I think we're going to be um, shortchanging ourselves, and we are not going to find the hard-to-uncover subrogation potential. Uh, in workers' compensation settings, we'll see that there are a lot of um, a lot of there's a lot of potential for subrogation that simply never sees the light of day. Now, I have a quick story. Um, I, by the way, I have three screens that were not included in your handout, and I apologize. They are not numbered. This is one of them. I kept the numbers the same. They got added, unfortunately, and inadvertently after uh, the um, PowerPoint in your handout had been, been sent out. But uh, a quick story uh, that I think reveals this. I was handling a workers' compensation subrogation case involving a single car rollover um, many years ago when I was in Houston, Texas. Uh, I was a managing partner with a 35-lawyer firm in downtown Houston. And uh, an insurance company came to me and said, uh, this gentleman was seriously injured. He was uh, quadriplegic um, due to a single car rollover. And uh, any, it, it, there doesn't look like there's any subrogation here, of course, because he drove off the road and hit a tree. So really, there's no one to sue. And it's then that we have to always stop and ask ourselves, is that really the case? Or is it simply our defense myopia speaking to us? Anytime someone sticks their hand in a machine, the, the, the natural reaction for most of the populace um, is to say, well, he shouldn't have stuck his hand in the machine. And that is true. And from a lay standpoint, that is actually uh, a true statement. If he hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have the accident. But we have someone whose job it is to stick his hands near uh, danger points, pinch points on a, on a dangerous instrumentality or machine eight, nine, ten hours a day, tired, untired, sick, maybe, uh, you know, sometimes people don't pay attention and uh, manufacturers have an obligation to prevent um, um, accidents by warning against them or guarding against them. And there are some times when um, the, the subrogation is actually unseen. Um, getting back to the, to the story, the, 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 the wife of this uh, gentleman who was seriously injured in a single car accident came to my office, and I had met with her because I had to explain to her, I am investigating this loss. I was hired by your, your husband's employer's workers' compensation carrier. They have asked me to look at to suing somebody and recovering back the money, and she was completely nonplussed. She could not understand how it was that we were going to be pursuing someone when there was no one involved but her husband and, and the car. And I said, well, we can't sue your husband, ma'am, but maybe we can sue the manufacturer of the car. And up go the red flags again. And, and I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, now, come on. I mean, there can't be a legal recourse for everything. And of course, that's true. But our job in investigating workers' compensation subrogate subrogation potential is to uncover that unseen subrogation. It, the rear end cases are easy. When your claimant is rear-ended at a stoplight and is hurt and the police shows up and writes a report and you get the report, you don't need me and you don't need this webinar to, sub, to investigate and, and successfully recover on that case. But it's the case where your employee is the one doing the rear ending. Those are the cases where the subrogation is unseen. Those are the cases where it's going to require you to put off that defense myopia that you carry with you. And we all do. 
And, uh, but th that, those are the times when it's necessary to overturn a few more stones to uncover the potential. So what I did was I was explaining to her um, that I was going to be prosecuting a crashworthiness case against uh, General Motors, uh, the manufacturer of the vehicle, because when the car overturned and it was a simple one car, uh, one one rotation roll, and the car landed back on its four wheels again, uh, uh, but the driver was quadriplegic at the time, uh, immediately afterwards. And what I explained to her was that we had hired an expert who went out and looked at the roof and did some testing and found some other problems with other accidents involving that make and model of vehicle. And um, <clears throat> she was completely shocked that there could be someone responsible. And what I had done is I invited I had invited a friend of mine, a lawyer from uh, just, just south of uh, Houston, who was a very, very good trial lawyer, to come and represent her family. And, and uh, she, I introduced her to a gentleman named Reed Morgan. And she was very appreciative. This was three months after the, uh, the accident. And um, she immediately began to cry. And she said, well, I appreciate your help, Gary. But now that I know that there's someone to pursue, I want to go out and find, no offense, Reed, I want to go out and find the best trial lawyer on the planet. She said, I want to go out, and this is what she said, I want to go out and find that lawyer that tried the McDonald's hot coffee case. Because if he can make a case out of that, he can make a case out of anything. And I turned to Reed, and then I turned back to the, to the wife, and I said, ma'am, this is Reed Morgan. This is the lawyer who tried the McDonald's hot coffee case. And uh, she gave him a hug, and she said, you're hired. Uh, and we made a recovery against General Motors in that case, uh, a case in which the insurance company never, ever considered that there might be subrogation potential. Times have changed. Over the last 30 years, my clients uh, have become more aggressive, more open-minded, and more objective about subrogation potential to the point where car accidents now, uh, where it looks like our insured lost control and went off the road and maybe even crossed the median and hit someone head on. I've got two of those out in California where uh, the clients have authorized investing in the file in order to hire tire experts and determine whether or not the tires, uh, which had blown out, might have uh, become defective. Um, so things are changing. But the, it's the unseen subrogation that we need to consider. And uh, just those golden arches sitting up on your screen right now are probably uh, sending some signals in your head like a uh, frivolous lawsuit. Um, completely ridiculous facts. How could anyone sue McDonald's for spilling hot coffee on themselves? And I'd like to take just a second to explain how subrogation, even when it's unseen, might still be lurking out there in files, especially large catastrophic loss files, which otherwise would simply be filed away without any recovery effort whatsoever. On February 27, 1992, a 79-year-old woman named Stella Liebeck from Albuquerque, New Mexico, ordered a 49-cent cup of coffee from the drive-thru of a local McDonald's restaurant. Um, this grandmother was the passenger in her own Ford Probe, and her grandson, Chris, had parked the car after ordering um, breakfast so that Stella could add cream and sugar to her coffee. So we're going to see the first of many um, uh, fabrications and uh, uh, which at least relate to this lawsuit, but McDonald's, was required, or McDonald's required their franchises, and still do to this day, to serve coffee at between 180 and 190 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 82 to 88 Celsius. At that temperature, coffee causes a third degree burn to human flesh in two to seven seconds. Uh, Stella's grandson uh, pulled the car forward and stopped the vehicle so she had cream, and when she did, she placed the coffee cup between her knees and pulled the lid back to add the um, coffee. And because of the temperature, it had weakened the styrofoam cup. And it spilled into her lap. She suffered full thickness burns over 6% of her body, including her inner thighs, perineum, buttocks, and genitals, and groin area. She was in the hospital for eight days, underwent skin grafting and burn to bride treatment, incurring significant medical expenses. Um, uh, and 
now she wasn't employed at the time, but this is an example. She lost 20 pounds, which was 20% of her body weight. Uh, she went down to 83 pounds, and she had two years of medical expenses, of treatment and medical expenses. Okay, so far so good. Still, be careful. Don't spill coffee on yourself. Well, she sought to settle with McDonald's for a mere $20,000, which wouldn't even have covered her medical expenses. Uh, but after McDonald's offered only $800, Reed Morgan, the uh, Texas City uh, attorney that uh, is a friend of mine, um, who is also licensed in New Mexico, filed a Mexico a New Mexico suit in uh, district court there, and accused them uh, McDonald's of selling coffee that was too hot. The mediator, right before mediation, suggested a settlement for two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. McDonald's refused. They went to trial. There was evidence of seven hundred other burn cases involving McDonald's and this high temperature coffee. Um, uh, experts came in and uh, talked about that between 180 and 190, this is almost boiling, uh, that the, the, uh, uh, the near boiling temperatures would cause almost instant third degree burns, that most establishments serve their coffee at substantially lower temperatures between 130 and 145 Fahrenheit, but that McDonald's studies had shown that it was the, the aroma and the smell from the coffee uh, sold better when it was hot, and that then when people traveled, it would end up, uh, they could travel further while the coffee still remained hot if they got it through the drive through the, the McDonald's quality assurance manager testified in his deposition that uh, they had strict quality assurance to make sure that all of the franchises served their coffee at 185 degrees, and they wouldn't let them serve it any lower than that. Um, the 12-person jury, or that also there was a quality control manager named Christopher, um, Christopher, I forgot his last name, who uh, angered the jury when he testified that the, the 700 injuries that they had sustained due to hot coffee was insufficient to cause the company to evaluate its practices. Uh, he testified about the, the millions of dollars in profits per day that they had just on coffee sales alone. Now, the jury verdict awarded Stella Liebig $200,000 in compensatory damages, reduced by 20% for her own negligence to $160,000, and they awarded her $2.7 million in punitive damages, probably, probably because the uh, quality assurance manager was somewhat arrogant on the stand and alienated the jury. The judge immediately reduced the, the punitive damages to $480,000, and so the total verdict was 640000 Now, that was never paid. And the decision was appealed, but the party settled out of court for an undisclosed amount of far less than that. Uh, Stella Liebig died at the age of 91 on uh, August 4, 2004. Now, frivolous lawsuits remain a drain on the insurance industry, on the American economy. Um, I am uh, no opponent of sensible tort reform. But the, the moral of the story here is that even in the most bizarre and perhaps frivolous seeming cases, there is unseen subrogation, which we owe it to ourselves, our employers, uh, our shareholders to pursue. And that's why when we talk about early recognition of subrogation, uh, it's going to require not only some aggressive investigation, but also understanding um, tort law. There is a seminar that we have, a webinar entitled Recognition of Subrogation Potential, and it is a first-year law school torts class on the very basics of duty, breach of duty, causation, damages. Um, I, it, it goes over premises liability, product liability, um, <clears throat> auto law, um, and, and into the nuts and bolts of, of when someone is liable to help us and to help those of us in the profession who, whose job it is to recognize subrogation, to understand the law um, behind this. So if you don't recognize subrogation, and sometimes you just have a nanosecond to do it, you get your first report, single car accident, drives off road, hits tree, no subrogation, move to the next file. Um, I've said this many times, and for those of you who have been to our webinars, you may have heard me say this. The four largest subrogation recoveries we have ever had have all been in files in which 
the files had been marked no subrogation, in which the insurance company looked at it and determined that there was no subrogation. So early recognition of subrogation is key. And without that, we don't have two and we don't have three. We have no prompt action. We can't because we don't recognize it. And we don't have any aggressive or cost-effective pursuit of subrogation because, of course, we don't recognize it. So like the McDonald's hot coffee case, which I'm not saying is the prototypical case that we should be pursuing, um, it, it's incumbent on us to recognize subrogation. And unless we do the legwork, which is what we're talking about here today, the investigation that we'll be getting into, unless we do the legwork and unless we understand the law, because without understanding the law, sometimes we don't know precisely what to investigate. I'll explain more on that in a minute. Um, and unless we understand how to investigate, we're not going to recognize subrogation. Because the investigation of subrogation in work comp settings is an opportunity. Um, we have to understand what opportunities subrogation law pr provides for us and look for that hidden subrogation. In addition, investigation sometimes reveals what needs to be investigated. The example I told you about going down to Illinois to uh, quote unquote investigate this mat that kept rolling up that uh, we think the claimant might have tripped over turned out to be something altogether different. It was an investigation into the complete lack of lighting, into a lack of maintenance. Now there are some significant issues in that case with the lease involving duties and exculpation and mutual releases in the, in, in the, uh, the release, no waiver of subrogation, but uh, those things can be overcome. But unless you understand that that's where you're looking, you will never even have the opportunity to overcome those potential obstacles and defenses. So we're going to be talking about overturning these stones um, one at a time. Now there's two main problems that we have with regard to uh, following through with these three items, these building blocks of work comp subrogation. Number one is a failure to investigate and preserve liability early. It's the number one problem I see. Over 27, I guess I can say 28 years now, um, because I started in November, um, uh, 28 years of uh, aggressive subrogation litigation, investigation, and trial work. Um, the number one problem I see is investigation um, lacking, uh, re subrogation not recognized, and as a result, things going stale. Witnesses um, disappearing, uh, evidence disappearing, um, conditions not recorded, uh, and basically as the clock ticks, uh, the difficult cases of subrogation, which are most of them, become even more difficult. So the failure to investigate and preserve liability, and secondly, the failure to recognize the hidden liability. Um, when we talk about investigation of work comp claims, and I, let me just stop for a second and say, we have another, I hate to heap even another obstacle in our way, but we have another problem that we have to overcome. And that is that in the, in the world of workers' compensation, many claims handlers um, may have the responsibility for recognizing subrogation, but when they do, it's turned over to someone else. Those who, don't, who have centralized recovery units or subrogation departments uh, generally have to check a box or forward something on to the subrogation department. We think there might be subrogation here. But that, you're the gatekeeper. Unless you look at that McDonald's hot coffee case, unless you look at that single car accident and say, aha, I think there might be subrogation here, you don't get to step two. And the people whose job it is to investigate and pursue subrogation oftentimes, depending on your, your procedures, your in-house protocol, may never get the chance to do that. So when you're wearing your workers' compensation hat, your claims hat, you're looking at, of course, a couple of very simple, and they're not simple when you get to some of the obfuscation of these things in various cases, but simply course and scope, the extent of the injury, and are there any possible claim defenses. Uh, after that, it's, it's simply processing, making sure that, and I, I don't mean to belittle the claims handling, but what I'm saying is, is that you have a, a claims hat on, and it's a defense-oriented hat. But when you have to take that hat off and put on the new hat that says subrogation, 
that's when um, your job becomes more difficult. That's when you have to um, wear that new hat and you, you sort of double as an investigator and um, a subrogation professionals. Sometimes you have to investigate, uh, you're talking about course and scope in the claims context. Well, that course and scope um, uh, investigation you do for work comp claims actually may carry over into the subrogation world where you have borrowed servant situations or uh, construction settings. And we have a lot of construction accidents where you're, you have to look at whether or not there was a right to control or whether or not um, uh, a subcontractor perhaps was, um, uh, was look, monitored or supervised by someone with the general contractor. So there's a lot of overlap. With the extent of injury, um, this may have a role in investigation of work comp subrogation in as much as if it's an auto case, you might be in a no-fault state where there are some thresholds that have to be reached, verbal thresholds, in order to pursue subrogation. Um, so there's overlap there. Claims defenses, horseplay, intoxication, intentional acts, these are all significant issues that need to be looked at in the work comp subrogation um, field as well uh, because they may have uh, play a large role in determining whether or not there's a lot of contributory negligence on the claimant, whether the case is worth investing um, some additional time and money. Uh, intentional acts, there may be situations where, and in many states, the majority of states allow a claim against a co-employee if the act constitutes gross negligence or intent, an intentional act. So these are some things that uh, intoxication. Uh, okay, intoxication played a role. We're denying this claim for, for one reason or another. Well, um, if, if intoxication is an issue and the claim is paid, maybe there's a dram shop case that comes into play here. Um, so there's 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 always some overlap that we sometimes fail to recognize. Now, successful workers' compensation subrogation involves three things, and I call them the three L's of successful workers' compensation uh, subrogation investigation. Number one is the liability. You have to understand tort liability. If you don't understand that you have an opportunity to pursue a manufacturer of a vehicle in a single car accident, if you don't understand that Perhaps there is some tort liability associated with um, a retread tire, a drive tire on a tractor trailer which ended up in a collision, uh, and that retread tire um, was the cause of the accident. You know, understanding the potential for third-party liability, in other words, becoming a, a, a law student and understanding the law, is actually a key part of successful subrogation investigation in the workers' compensation arena, and in any arena for that matter. But it's often one of the more difficult, and that's where education comes into play. Number two, understanding the law. And what I mean by the law isn't uh, product liability law, premises liability law, dog bite law. And again, there's a dog bite chart, for example, on our, on our homepage of the, of the, web, uh, the, um, uh, the website for our firm. And, you can look and see what the law is. Does, does a dog have to have one bite or two before it can be pursued? Is there a strict liability as there is in Wisconsin in some situations? Those are things that you have to know to understand the tort liability. But when I talk about understanding subro law, I'm talking about something completely different. If you are in Alabama and um, you are investigating a claim and you realize that the two-year statute of limitations has run, instead of closing the file, if you understand that you actually have six months after the statute of limitations has run to file a third-party action, um, you will successfully, um, or you have a chance for a successful subrogation, whereas otherwise you would have closed the file. If you are in a state where uh, the employer's negligence reduces the recovery and induces the plaintiff's re reduces the plaintiff's recovery altogether. Uh, understanding that will help you understand what to focus on in terms of your investigation. If you're in a state which allows now Missouri just had a recent case that came out late last year 
uh, in which a co-employee is now again fair game to be sued. So if you have a case and um, you can look at possible co-employee negligence as opposed to a state where you cannot, your investigation will be much different. You will focus on different things. And uh, this goes on and on. Med mal, if you're in a state um, where medical malpractice is a possible third party, you will uh, be able to investigate that, whereas you wouldn't if you were in a state where it wasn't. Legal malpractice, same thing. Um, can you recover from UM or UIM benefits? Investigation is more than taking photographs and taking a few statements. If you understand that you have the right in Texas to recover your workers' compensation lien from an uninsured motorist policy owned by the employer, or paid for by the employer, you will ask a few different questions and try and obtain some additional information that you might otherwise not obtain. Um, one of the tricks I use in, in cases where, say, you can recover against a, U, uh, a UM policy of the employer is uh, um, you, can, you can go and obtain that policy and find out what the coverage is, and then you can work with the plaintiff's lawyer who may not understand or realize that uh, you have that right or don't have that right, and some, some deals can be struck. When I'm curious about uh, third-party coverage, uh, you can call up a third party like a contractor out in California that I called who just got done working on a large truck stop out there and within an hour the truck stop had burned to the ground. Six and six point one million dollars later we're looking at a huge loss. Well it part of my investigation I want to know what that coverage is. Well Gary you can't find that out until you file suit and ask for well you can. I simply call them up and I say hey I'd like to hire you to come and do some work but my boss wants to know if you guys are covered by insurance first and how well you're covered. Bingo. Not only do I get the information, but they shoot me an email with a certificate of insurance attached. There are a lot of creative ways to get the information that you need, but understanding several law is a key element in uh, successfully investigating um, subrogation. Now, lastly, labor. I think it's... Um, it goes without saying that it does take time and you have to use the tools at your disposal to look for that unseen subrogation that we talked about. You have to develop it and you have to preserve it. I mean these are all separate and independent functions. Uh, without any one of them we have no subrogation. So the responsibility is, is quite large. Um, and uh, taking the time to do it, I think, is, is, is the labor that we're talking about. If you understand and approach this uh, as though subrogation is an investment, and quite honestly, probably one of the better investments you can make out there. When you have a large loss and you're looking at possibly investing $3,000 to have an expert go and do a, a report on uh, possible causation of an accident, um, and the upside is several hundred thousand dollars in recovered uh, benefit payments, that's, that's a great investment. It's a better bet that you can make anywhere in Vegas and probably a better investment than much of what's out there these days, unfortunately. So um, uh, you take the time to uh, approach subrogation and, and approach it like it, it is a religion um, and without being... Um, um, irreverent. I mean, sub, you have to approach subrogation as though you firmly believe in it. It requires faith. Faith that your efforts will pay off in the long run. It requires devotion. Uh, devotion to the concept that you reap what you sow. If you put in the time and the energy, there quite often is subrogation where it otherwise would not even be recognized. Uh, there's a this story about um, an atheist who was walking through the woods and he was looking at the majestic trees and, and powerful rivers. What beautiful animals, he said to himself as he walks through Mother Nature. And, and then he was walking alongside the river. He heard a rustling in the bushes behind him and he turned and looked and saw an eight-foot grizzly bear charging toward him. He ran as fast as he could up the path and looked over his shoulder and saw that the bear was closing in on him rapidly. And obviously he knew he could not run the bear so he looked over his shoulder again, and the bear was even closer, and he tripped and just fell to the ground. He rolled over to pick himself up, but the bear was right on top of him, so the atheist reached, reached up and, 
You saw the bear was about to just take him down with his paw, and at that minute the atheist cried out, oh my God, time stop, time stop. The bear froze, and the forest was silent, and a bright light shone through the sky, and uh, a voice came out of the sky. You deny my existence for all these years. You teach others I don't exist, and you even credit creation to cosmic accident. Do you expect me to help you out of this predicament when you call my name? It might account on you as a believer, the voice says. Well, the atheist looked directly into the light and thought for a second. He said, well, it, it would be hypocritical of me now to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian, but perhaps you could make the bear into a Christian. Very well, the voice said, and the light went out. The sounds of the forest resumed, and the bear immediately dropped his paw and brought both pa paws together, bowed his head and spoke, Lord, bless this food which I'm about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. The, the, the moral of the story is um, if you treat subrogation with the faith and devotion that, that is required of it, um, nine times out of ten you will see results. We talked about the three questions you have to ask when adjusting a work comp claim. Well, here's five questions that you should ask any time you are looking at a potential subrogation case in a workers' compensation claim. Um, number one, what are your subrogation rights? And for those of you who have attended the Advanced Workers' Compensation Subrogation Webinar, you'll recognize these five questions and recall that we go into great deal or detail on each one of them, which we will not do today. Um, but, but it's important because the investigation of the claim also requires that you understand the, um, uh, what, what your subrogation rights are. And when I say what are your subrogation rights, I mean, are you able to pursue this claim on your own if the claimant doesn't? I have a very, very good case in Hawaii right now um, in which the woman, for one, she's a native Hawaiian. Her ancestors go all the way back to King Wamehameha or whatever his name was. But she, she's very spiritual and does not want anything to do with this lawsuit. Her husband was killed. Um, so right off the bat, we have to ask ourselves, well, what are our subrogation rights? And every state is different. And this is what makes subrogation so difficult. There are 51, including the District of Columbia, bodies of law. And they all approach the myriad of different issues and questions that arise in work comp subrogation differently. In Hawaii, we can pursue, but we have to wait until nine months um, after the claim. And then we have to give notice, and there's some procedural requirements. But understanding that also helps us understand what we can do. Um, there are states, and I had a client call me the other day, where we don't have the ability to file suit. And all we have is a right of reimbursement. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do if you run across a claimant or a widow like this who does not want to pursue the claim. So understanding what your subrogation rights are, who you, understanding who the third parties are that can be sued, that med mal target, the, the, the doctor who misprescribed or, or was negligent and nicked the, um, the nerve sac, or um, the, uh, the lawyer who failed to file suit timely and thereby lost you your opportunity to recover from a third party. Are these cases that you can pursue? Can you pursue UM benefits? Uh, can you pursue co-employees? What about in construction settings? The trend, unfortunately, the trend these days is to forget about subrogation and forget about all of the societal benefits that it has and sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, we're, what we're going to do, like in the state of Nevada, is we're going to just deem everybody who's involved in these wrap-up and OSIP uh, plans as all being one happy family, and they're all implied employers, co-employers, and we're not going to be able to sue anybody in that setting. And this is going to help keep down the cost of construction and the cost of insurance. Well, what it ends up doing is preventing um, clear liability cases from being pursued with large workers' compensation liens. Um, and that's not good. Understanding who you can sue, under, understanding how a recovery is ultimately to be allocated. Now you understand these have nothing to do with how fast someone was traveling, who had the red light, uh, was the uh, were there some pieces missing in the scaffolding from which the employee fell, um, was the tire retread 16 times 
uh, that was the, on the left front uh, steer tire of, of the vehicle, which overturned. Th these are questions that have nothing to do with the facts, but still are extremely important in the investigation of a work comp claim. Our attorney's fees are cost owed. All right, knowing that, uh, do we get a future credit? If you find a state where you may not be able to recover, um, and if you understand early on that you may not be able to recover on an accident that occurs in Nevada, um, we, if, if you have the ability to um, um, steer the state in which the benefits are paid out of by recommending to the claimant, hey, well, you know, maybe uh, you want California benefits. Not quite as good for us, better for you, but under California law, we would have a right of recovery. Understanding those things early on will help with a recovery later on down the road. And of course, those issues are things we get into in some of the other, other webinars. So understanding subrogation law is just as big a part of investigation as is investigating the facts. Um, and that's why I talked about those first. Now, one of the reasons, before we get into the investigation, one of the reasons why subrogation is so difficult, if it's done right, uh, is, you know, there's 51 jurisdictions plus Longshore, Harbor Workers, Compensation Act, FELA. Uh, the law is always changing. You are nine times out of ten going to be the party crasher. You're nobody's friend. You're always the third wheel on the date. Plaintiffs, defendants, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes judges, mediators will always conspire to try and make you go away. You are the fly in the ointment, um, and, and it, it, it is difficult. But investigation is more than just the accident. Keep in mind those five questions we just talked about and understand that you know, ignorance is bliss. One of the things I see is, that, uh, is the mindset of, you know what? Um, we got fifteen thousand dollars on this case, and you know that's better than nothing. It's found money. It's a gift. You know, I feel pretty good about that because it's fifteen thousand dollars that I wouldn't have had. And my response in some of these cases is, but do you understand you've paid out six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and you're accepting fifteen? Why not go after the six fifty? Well, I, you know, I, quite frankly, I don't think that there's a case here. I, I think we we could get it. Ignorance really is bliss, and if subrogation is, e subrogation is easy, if you're okay with leaving millions of dollars on the table, and that's what we do in this industry day after day after day, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, institutional, it's systematic, it's something that has been built into our system since the 70s when subrogation wasn't even pursued, and in the 80s when we started to recognize, hey, we got some potential here. Let's uh, hire a few people to handle our subrogation files, but we're going to put them in the basement, you know, where there's no air conditioning. And, uh, and then into the 90s, when we started considering subrogation a little more and we're pursuing it more aggressively, but we ended up uh, fraternizing with the enemy. And oftentimes we'd try and cut deals with the plaintiff's attorneys, and then they'd be the ones who were trying to, to uh, shortchange us by telling us that we didn't have a, a right to recover or that... Uh, the case has gone south now, and, and we need to settle for pennies on the dollar. Or please do a third and a third and a third on a, on a recovery in which you could have all of your money back. And the third, third, and the third, of course, is the the uh, the well-known anecdotal. Um, we have a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Why doesn't the claimant take a third? The claimant's lawyer will take a third, and you, the comp carrier, take a third. Which sounds good, except for the fact that you've got a ninety-five thousand dollar lien. Uh, and there really is no reason why you have to take a third when, um, depending on the, the, the law, uh, you, you may be able to recover it all back. So, um, but investigation, understanding why we investigate is critical. It is uh, extremely important. It's perhaps the only chance we have at some evidence. And what do I mean by that? Um, Let's take slip and falls, for example, and uh, if the weather is not good, it's probably 15 degrees where I am, um, and there's snow everywhere, um, and slip and falls are commonplace. Uh, all of northern United States has developed a body of law called the natural accumulation rule. When you have people who slip and fall on ice, the concept is, well, 
if snow or ice accumulates naturally, and there are some differences from state to state, but if snow and ice accumulates naturally on a sidewalk, on a parking lot, on a, on a stoop, uh, then generally private premises owners, landlords in landlord-tenant situations, and even governmental entities, municipalities, cities, towns, states, counties, will have no liability for, quote unquote, the natural accum accumulation that God put into place on the ground. We will not be able to pursue in many situations. Uh, we know it colloquially as, well, slip and falls are bad, and they're doubly bad when it's you're in northern states in the winter. So you get a slip and fall, the first thing I do is look at the date, up oh, January 18th. Not good. Well, we're not done investigating simply by looking at the date and understanding that it's not good. Natural accumulation implies that there must be an unnatural accumulation. Now what does that mean? Unnatural accumulation can mean that uh, there has been some leaking water through a rain gutter or uh, a pipe or some discharge or somebody was throwing uh, water out uh, outside of a restaurant or a business. An unnatural accumulation is something that happens unnaturally. Well, that makes sense, Gary. But unnatural accumulation can mean even more. It can mean that a natural accumulation on the ground becomes unnatural if, for example, it's on a slope or a man-made ramp of some sort. Uh, I had a case last week we investigated, it didn't look good, but we gave it the investment that it was required of the case. Uh, had an investigator, investigator go out and I wanted to know two things. This goes back to my geometry. How tall was the slope? It was a ramp that a gentleman was delivering some bread at a grocery store. How tall was that ramp um, at the end of it? <clears throat> and how long was the ramp? And that gave me the hypotenuse and I'm able to calculate the degree or percent of slope and, and this is in Illinois. Illinois has law, case law, which says if it's a 2%, 2.5% uh, slope, that is still a natural accumulation. But the law is wide open for larger slopes, uh, which could constitute an unnatural accumulation. So this is information that I need to know before I go investigate. Otherwise, I don't know what to investigate. Someone may go out there and just take a few photographs and um, interview a witness and say, oh, he slipped on some ice. Well, if it's an unnatural accumulation, <clears throat> excuse me, we have the opportunity to, um, to pursue. Give me one second, I'm going to get a drink. You want to catch witnesses when the memories are fresh. This is critical. And you want to catch witnesses before they have a chance to have their minds changed for them. This is especially true in significant injury cases where, say, the employer and co-employees may be contacted by the supervisor who is very much afraid that his, his um, company is going to get sued and they're going to be put out of business and all this anecdotal um, urban legends that, that obviously aren't the case. People don't understand, and especially the employers, when a significant injury happens one of the first things you must do in investigating the claim, which isn't really an investigative function at all, is to go to the employer and explain. We have an injury. The law in your state allows us to investigate and possibly pursue any third-party tortfeasor responsible for the injury. What do I mean by third-party, not first-party, the employee, not second party, you the employer, but third party, someone other than you or the employee. And by the way, your law completely protects you. The exclusive remedy for this employee is against you is workers' compensation. You cannot be sued. Now you get into a little, some dicey areas in Illinois and Minnesota where there are contribution claims, but those can work, that can work to your advantage too. But the point here is that you want to go to the employer immediately and explain to them that not only can you not be hurt by what we're about to do, but you can be helped. Getting into the, the uh, uh, loss modifiers, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, loss history and the effect on experience mods and workers' compensation premium rates, explaining that if you can have a full recovery and a reserve takedown in this case that 
um, <clears throat> their loss history and their premium record might be dropped down to as though this thing had never happened before, and that will affect what you pay for years in work comp premiums. And um, besides, if um, we help the plaintiff become wealthy, which oftentimes people have a knee-jerk reaction against, well, look, he slipped and fell inside that trailer, but, you know, we all have to work under those conditions, and it just doesn't seem right that Joe here would be able to recover several hundred thousand dollars and put it in the bank when all these other workers, and I've had other guys who have fallen too, they just, you know, were able to catch themselves. You, know, you get this, this attitude that has to be overcome because frequently the employer becomes one of the key witnesses, especially if the injury occurred on the premises. So catch witnesses when their memory are fresh. You want to identify and retain evidence unless you get there soon after the loss you may have no possibility of recording for time immemorial what the conditions were at the time of the loss. Uh, it may be your only chance to recognize the issues that are involved. Unless you go out and actually turn over those rocks, you won't have the ability to um, uh, understand what legal issues might be involved, yet alone what factual issues. I've always said that the time and energy that you spend on investigating a work comp loss is inversely proportionate to the cost of subrogating. If you have a no loss time case with uh, you know $1,300 in medical, you are not going to want to hire an expert to go out and, and uh, you don't want to overturn every single pebble because it simply isn't cost effective. And that's one of the concerns that we have when investigating, always keeping our bean counter hat on while wearing our investigative subrogation hat. But if you have a significant loss, um, <clears throat> the cost of subrogating is um, just exponentially increased the longer we have to wait to get the facts. The more witnesses go away or have their minds changed or forget, the more evidence that disappears, the fewer photographs we have means that our job of proving liability becomes that much more difficult and time-consuming. Uh, investigation helps identify roadblocks, indemnity, waiver. Uh, the case I told you about where we went out and investigated the slip and fall on the stoop uh, where we discovered there was no lighting. Well, now the issue becomes one of indemnity and exculpation in a lease. Well, we, did, we didn't know that until we, we went out there. So uh, you identify some of the roadblocks, which now you have a chance to overcome, whereas otherwise you would not. The other thing is that your investigation literally becomes a walkthrough for the third-party lawsuit. <clears throat> it's an inexpensive way of really test driving this, this case, your, your third-party case. Uh, auto intersection collision. You know, of course, you get the driver's statement. Maybe, hopefully, there's witnesses in the car. And by the way, whenever you have an auto intersection collision, <clears throat> I see the, um, and, and I have seen uh, more improved statements taken over the last 10 years than some of the horrible, horrible statement taking I used to see back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, you know, what's your name? What happened? Have you understood my questions? Thank you. Uh, get a checklist. I mean, really, I use a checklist. I use a checklist in every deposition I take. Even though I can do it by memory, I want to make sure that, that I don't forget anything. And sometimes a bullet point on that checklist turns on something in my head <clears throat> and reminds me that there's an avenue that I want to explore. And don't just take the statement of the driver. Uh, more important may be the statement of the passengers, who may be the only witnesses to the accident. Interested witnesses, yes, but maybe the only witnesses um, and we'll talk more about, about that in a second. Um, the other thing is that the investigation is on the job training for subrogation and claims personnel. It's a good way for them to understand what subrogation is, what happens when the subrogation file leaves your office and comes to mind. Um, it gives you the opportunity to lock witnesses into positions and testimony. One of the great tricks, it's not really a trick because it's partly true, but when I take a statement <clears throat> of a witness, I will ask them if, um, and a lot of times I'll record it and ask them if I, I'm going to type it out and then have them sign it. 
And, well, that's a hassle. Why do they want to do all that? Well, I simply tell them, look, it's going to uh, make your life easier because if anybody comes to you and says, what happened? Can you talk to me? Just tell them I've already given my statement, and I've given it to Gary Wickert. You can go get it from him. Uh, and then when it comes time for your deposition, um, I'll show them your statement, and maybe they won't want to take it and have you sit in a, a boring conference room for three hours. Now, that, that isn't, it's really only a half-truth because a statement isn't going to prevent a deposition, but it does get them interested in um, doing their best job on the statement and always have them sign the statement. Um, I say always have them sign it. If it's, a, if it's critical testimony, you want them to sign it because then they will not be able to change their testimony. Uh, and if they do, they will have to explain why they read it and then changed it. Um, and, and we'll talk toward the end of this, this webinar a little bit about notice to government entities, <clears throat> what a critical role that is, too, because if you see the file a week after the loss to start segregation investigation, I might see it two weeks later, um, and in some cases four or six or eight or 163 weeks later. Uh, I still see, and if we have a weakness in our industry, I still end up getting the files after every possible attempt at resolving them is is exhausted. And then it comes to me, uh, and unfortunately, many times things are too late. We'll get into notice to government entities. The city of Austin, Texas, for example, their city charter requires 30 days. 30 days. That's that's nothing. <clears throat> I mean, that's a, a mini-series. And by the time it's over, um, things are too late. Um, the way to look at investigation and the why um, I think can be summed up with, with a parable that I tell. Some of you may have heard it, but um, one night there were a group of, of nomads preparing to retire for the evening when suddenly they were surrounded by a great light. They knew for instantly that they were in the presence of a celestial being and, and nervous and shaking with fear. They crawled out of their tents, and with great anticipation, they awaited uh, a heavenly message of great importance that they knew must be especially for them. Finally, the voice spoke, and in a deep, booming voice that shook the earth, the voice said, gather as many pebbles as you can, put them in your saddlebags, travel a day's journey, and tomorrow night you will be glad, and it, you, you, tomorrow night you will be glad and sad. After having departed, the voice went away and the light went away. The nomads looked at one another and shared their disappointment and anger. They had expected the revelation of great, a great universal truth, one that they'd be able to help them create wealth and health and prosperity. But instead, they were given this menial task of picking up some pebbles and putting them in their saddlebags. So while voicing their displeasure, they each muttered under their breath and picked up a few pebbles and put them in their bags. And the next day, they traveled the day's journey. And that night, while making camp, they reached into their saddlebags. And they had discovered that every pebble they had gathered had become a diamond. And they were instantly glad, glad that they had taken the time to flip, flip, pick up a few pebbles. But they were also sad that they had not taken the time to stuff their saddlebags full of pebbles. And the moral of, moral of the story is you do not know when you're investigating a claim. As you're asking the questions, obtaining the leases, taking the myriad of photographs, uh, obtaining evidence, you don't know what's going to be significant. When you're asking the questions, you don't know exactly which question is going to be the million dollar question until you wake up after the suit is over with, after the subrogation effort is, is complete. and um, you find that what you did really did affect the outcome of the case. So what is it that we do in the investigation of the work comp case? Well, obviously, we've talked, and I started first with and hit hard with the fact that you, the law uh, in understanding the issues is part of your investigation because it may prescribe what it is you need to investigate or, and perhaps more importantly, what you don't need to investigate. But the what, what it is that we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the facts and details surrounding the injury or death. Um, the investigation becomes a valuable, valuable commodity 
that can be used for advantage. And what I mean by that is this is work product. Quite often, the statements you take, the photographs you take, the measurements you take, the uh, expert that you hire, the efforts that you engage in to aggressively investigate a loss turn out to be diamonds. And what I mean by that is the claimant hires an attorney, and you know they don't often get into the game early on. It could be months later. Uh, evidence disappears for them too. They're not God. I mean, they when they get involved in a case, they have the same struggles we have. And if they get into the game late, or some Yahoo attorney, a friend of an uncle of the claimant, has been handling the case and firing off demand letter after demand letter, and then 19 months later, they refer it to an experienced trial lawyer who looks at it and goes, wow, I wish I'd had this case from day one. Well, there is some place they can come to play catch up, and that's us. The investigation that you perform, the statements that you take, the work that you do, all it becomes work product. Work product that is actually privileged. If you are doing the investigation in anticipation of litigation in the law of laws of most states, it becomes privileged and cannot be turned. Uh, we cannot be made to turn it over to anybody unless we want to. The reason that's good <clears throat> is that quite often we have an opportunity to cut a deal with the plaintiff's lawyer and say, wow, do I have some stuff for you? I not only have the product, I have statements, I have a photograph before the blood was cleaned up, I have um, recorded statements, written statements, I have an expert who is a consulting expert for us who went out there and can testify as to the conditions right after the loss. Every one of the things I've just mentioned, he does not have. And most of those things he cannot now get. He has to try this case from a second tier with, with second class evidence and an expert who will have to testify on the stand. He did not get out there to see the conditions. So what I can do then is say, I will give these things to you in exchange for a stipulation a stipulation that you will repay my client their work comp lien, that you will not take attorney's fees out of the lien. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and once he enters into that agreement, we can then sit back and, and our subrogation rights should be protected. Now, I, I don't encourage you to rely on trial lawyers to protect your subrogation interests. We'll talk about that in a moment, too. But uh, this is, becomes a diamond that we can now put out on the free market and, and, and negotiate with, with the trial lawyer. Um, the work you do, I've got a large hearing in Dallas in a week and a half on a, a mammoth work comp case in which the, in, in many states the plaintiff's attorneys can take a chunk of your lien off the top. Um, and again, here we get to this mentality, well, you know, Two-thirds of $1.8 million is a lot of money, Gary. Uh, you know what? But it's not quite as much as 100% of $1.8 million. And if we can avoid the plaintiff's attorney from being able to take fees off the top of your work comp lien, we will do that. How do we do it? By hard work. It's the labor. If you remember back to that slide, the three L's, the third L was labor. And if we can work hard from the beginning on the investigation, Many times I can take your work product, put it in the form of an affidavit like I will do in Dallas, and go in front of the judge and say, see this affidavit? <clears throat> it's about 46 pages. It outlines everything we did on this case. And the law in many states, like Texas, is that the judge must take into consideration the relative amount of work that the plaintiff's attorney did and the work comp attorney did to protect the work comp lien and then they will apportion the fees. So we can, in many cases, get the fees knocked down to zero. Or in some states, like Wisconsin, recover not only 100% of the lien, but also attorney's fees on top of it, because we can now eat into the plaintiff's attorney's fees. And you want to talk about a way to get, uh, <clears throat> uh, get someone angry at you. It's a trial lawyer in which you try and take away some of his attorney's fees. Investigation is also a means to uncover subrogation killers like indemnity and waiver. Um, again, you protect witnesses from disappearing. Uh, quick tip, if you're, 
any any time you interview anybody, ask a simple question. Uh, can you give me the name and phone number of your nearest relative? Because once that person disappears, moves to somewhere in New Mexico, and is hard to locate, we at least can call Aunt Mabel and say, hey, do you know where Billy went? Oh, sure, he's in Santa Fe. Here's his cell number. Um, a real simple question, and just getting um, uh, nearest family member and some contact information works wonders. Uh, so the other thing is the, the what is the opportunity to represent the plaintiff's interest. There are some cases that are worthy of just saying, hey, um, we'll not only represent the work comp carrier, but also the, the claimant. And that allows us to recover 100% of the work comp lien, 100% of our attorney's fees, and then whatever is left over, the, the uh, claimant gets. So when we talk about the what, um, these are some of the, uh, the, the things that investigation does. Now the how? Um, well, these aren't new to anybody. And anybody uh, who's listening obviously is listening because they have or will have some investigative responsibilities with regard to work comp claims. Um, but let's talk about some of them. Um, statements and recordings. We've talked briefly about that. Photographs. Uh, we, we live in a wonderful age, an age in which we can take digital photography. We don't have uh, film like we normally had. We can take hundreds and hundreds of photographs. The more, the better. Don't be stingy with photographs. Preserving evidence. We can observe witnesses. We can see how well, um, uh, how good of a witness uh, somebody makes. And that can be all the difference in the world. I, I um, started practicing my, my um, craft back in the... Uh, late 70s, early 80s with a trial lawyer named John O'Quinn down in Houston, Texas. Probably one, if probably the best trial lawyer to ever live. He tragically died last fall in a car accident that uh, nobody's going to subrogate. It was his own accident, but his own fault. But um, he taught me how to try a lawsuit. He was on the cover of Forbes magazine twice, more $100 million verdicts than any lawyer. And he told me one thing, and I've remembered it ever since. Gary, um, the number one factor in how good of a lawsuit you have is not, are not the facts. It's the plaintiff. How good of a witness does someone make? Because nine times out of ten, people are going to help someone they like. And if someone makes a good witness, it is often more important than what that witness says. And that's true with the claimant as well. Uh, taking measurements, documents, engaging experts. Um, one of the things that we um, need to remind our clients is when you engage experts, um, you, you often want the right expert for the right price with the right discipline. And I see far too many cases come to me, um, and it could be a catastrophic explosion in a um, uh, uh, power plant, or it could be a slip and fall outside of a grocery store, and I see the same expert on the case. He writes the same report in the same format. Um, and probably has a good price, and maybe even come in and dog a, done a dog and pony show with, with the insurance company and has some cut rate deal, and a memo went out, let's use this guy on all of our cases. Um, not good. Um, it may save you some money, and a little bit, if that, in the short run, but you want the right expert. You want the good expert on the, on the big cases that are difficult, and um, the, the not so good expert on the smaller cases, the less expensive experts. Um, we have spent 20 plus years gathering experts around the country. We have close to 50,000 of them uh, cataloged, organized electronically, um, searchable by discipline, electrical, mechanical, um, uh, engineering. Uh, we have them organized by venue, by geography, and by price. And all of those things are important and uh, equally important when uh, subrogating a case. Uh, I've always said you can't spend yourself into a successful subrogation program. Um, it's easy. You, I can probably recover on any file you send me if I, I have unlimited funds to do it with. Um, <clears throat> so th those are some considerations and experts. If you have any questions, you can use the subrogation question form on our website and say, I've got such and such a case. Uh, a gentleman fell from the scaffolding. I'd like to get it investigated right away. Who do you recommend? Um, 
And if, if you have to get permission to do that, get it. But I, I think that's a better choice because oftentimes that expert is the expert for the case. When the plaintiff's attorney gets involved later on and um, he hasn't had the time or doesn't want an expert who hasn't been able to go out and see the actual scene, your expert becomes the expert for the case. And if it's not a good expert, the case is no good. And many times trial lawyers will turn down the case if there's nobody qualified on it. And by the way, um, just recently Wisconsin entered the growing number of states that follow uh, Daubert and uh, some of the more rigorous rules that were designed to prevent junk science. Um, and in a way they do that, but in, in a way they also make uh, litigation more expensive. Um, so we, we, we have to be careful that the expert we get is truly someone who's qualified in the area we're in. And if we're in a jurisdiction in which you have to come up with a reasonable alternative design that was feasible in a products case, in some venues you do, um, then you have to have someone with design experience. And if he doesn't, you simply can't make a products case with such an expert. <laughs> um, giving proper notice, coming to conclusions, writing summaries and recommendations, and engaging subrogation counsel. Now, um, I'm, I'm always careful not to stump for work in these webinars because I really feel that the value in them is simply the, the, um, the education. Uh, our job becomes much easier the more you know and, and, and the more mistakes we can avoid early in the case. Um, of the bullet points on the page you're looking at, um, um, all of them we can do. And we do investigation in files. Um, but it's not necessary. Unless you have a catastrophic loss, in which case I would really like to be involved in the first uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bullet points. Um, so really, in, in those cases, if you would just go out and, and engage quality subrogation counsel to do the investigation, uh, we have a program, by the way, in which we will actually do the investigation. We do, we do it on an hourly basis, and then the minute we're done, we flip the case to a contingency and give you full credit for any hourly fees billed. Um, and that's worked out pretty well, and it prevents um, us from simply becoming a non-paid uh, arm of your claims department, which, of course, I couldn't afford to do. But the, the, the point is that in the cases that merit it, um, the results are fabulous. And... Um, like I said, what you put into it, the investment you make, really um, goes a long way in determining how successful we will be in subrogation. Now, third-party liability, I'm not going to go into too much on this because we've talked a little bit about it already, but understand that third-party liability um, is only affected if you recognize the liability of a third-party tortfeasor. Um, you want to understand concepts of general negligence medical malpractice, premises liability. We, I mean, even today, in, in, a, in a webinar about investigating, we've already talked about the natural accumulation rule, what that means. Um, uh, we have a webinar entitled Recognizing Subrogation that focuses solely on what you see on this page. Um, what is the law? And, and we go into the laws in various states as well because it does differ. Um, malpractice. When, when can a landlord uh, the insured for a landlord sue a tenant for burning down, you know, a building or or causing injury to um, uh, to to someone. Um, the dog bite situation for a, um, a UPS driver. Uh, understanding what the law is and understanding what you have to show. Anytime you have an employee who's injured, uh, who strikes a, a a cow or a steer or a horse in 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 the middle of a road who got loose from a from a corral or a pen. Um, understanding what the law is in that particular jurisdiction tells you and is literally a road map to what it is you have to do in your investigation. There's no sense in going out and investigating if you're not sure what you have to investigate. So that's where we get back to understanding um, the law is part of the investigative process. Um, knowing who can be sued and um, again can the employer be sued for contribution? If so, there's an entire body of questions that need to be asked about training, about oversight, about supervision, um, because I guarantee you, you don't ask him, uh, ask those questions. The defense counsel will um, ultimately ask those questions. Um, you know, auto accidents remain 
a very, very prevalent source of workers' compensation subrogation. Uh, people are always working in their cars, auto accidents. I, I, I've forgotten the number. I'm actually, and I, by the way, you will be the first ones to hear this. Um, we are in the finishing stages of a new book entitled Automobile Insurance Subrogation in All 50 States. I announced it to NASP uh, the other day. But um, this is going to be a 1,700-page volume go governing the laws of subrogation in all 50 states, um, starting with uh, PIP, no pay, uh, PIP, med pay subrogation, family purpose doctrine, guest statutes, uh, statutes of limitations, um, just about any aspect, made whole, common funds, seatbelt defense, um, uh, just anything. I mean, the rules on what you can recover, loss of use, um, everything is going to be contained in the book. And, and the reason I, I enjoy that, and tr trust me about one thing, I promise you that my son, my youngest son, works at a putt-putt golf course, and I, when this thing is over, I don't care how many books are sold, he will make more per hour than will we making this book. That's not the reason for it. The reason is because it really will make our job easier. It will make the profession's job easier. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the reception it gets. And uh, it's going to be published by Juris Publishing. It probably will be out um, toward the end of the summer. My deadline is June 1st to get it in. And then they, they do a whole lot of work on it from there. But, but getting back to auto subrogation, um, these are some very, very common, um, uh, a common source of subrogation. And it's important to understand that when you're out taking photographs and conducting your investigation, um, there, there are additional things that can be done. For example, um, black boxes and event data recorders, EDRs, for years now without any knowledge on the part of most motorists. Many of us in this audience have black boxes or EDRs in our cars without knowing it. Several car manufacturers now have been installing electronic data recorders. Um, black boxes, if you will, in their vehicles. There's more than 30 million cars and trucks on the road with these devices. And uh, they provide a differing, uh, a broad array of information, um, including speed, braking, just about anything you want to know about an accident can be uh, uh, determined by uh, looking at that event data recorder. Um, when you photograph an accident, um, I, I think it's important to just remember a couple of things. Common events are you want to, uh, a point of possible perception. You want to take a photograph from exactly where the, uh, the insured, the employee would have been um, when he had a chance to avoid any possible uh, danger and then uh, a, a picture from where the accident happened. So the, the point of perception is where a normally attentive person could have perceived the hazardous situation. And it always comes at or before the point of perception. Um, uh, and and there's, a, there's a series of, uh, of um, different photographs that you want. I mean, you, overall of the scene facing the direction of the vehicle's approach, the area of impact, the fixed object damage, sight distances, sight obstructions, road condition, every, any evidence you're about to secure, the point of rest of the vehicles, any objects or people, tire marks, metal scars or big gouges, um, debris, um, uh, pavement edge drop off, fluid marks. Um, I take pictures and have my investigators take pictures of uh, what's going on in all four corners of any intersection. I want to know is there an establishment there? Is there a gas station? There are a number of cases I've had where I've been able to go and get security cameras that have actually detailed what happened in an accident. Um, so it's it's kind of fun. It's like um, you know CSI, where you can go out and and, and do a lot of um, uh, creative investigation. Uh, weather conditions, you can go to weather underground, underground, and a lot of other sources to get actual specific data for a very specific venue, um, and those are all significant and important. Um, you want to talk to the police officer. Um, get the names of witnesses. I always go to the nearby businesses. I always knock and go in and who is working on this day. Can I get their phone number, please? Uh, call them. Did you happen to see anything? No, I just heard the screech of brakes. And I looked over and I saw the red car hit the blue car. And the light was green. 
Well, that's evidence you never would have gotten. Um, so, and you know, I, I, I also appreciate and, and suggest the common sense approach to investigation. And this is, this is something that um, I think doesn't come naturally, but if you think about it, it really should. If you have an accident in which your employee says he was at a, a, a red light and then the light turned green and he proceeded and he was then struck in the, the far left-hand rear corner of the vehicle, well, that tells you a couple of things. It tells you that if, if someone is going to lie about a red light or a green light, it's going to be that the, the light was green when they went through it. They're not going to say it was red and then it turned green and they hit the accelerator. So if you're insured, if your employee was at a red light, hit the accelerator, and proceeded through the intersection, now in most states they still have a duty to look out for other vehicles. Just because the light's green doesn't absolve them of any negligence. But if they're hit in the left far rear corner of the vehicle, it tells me that's, that the other party was truly trying to beat an amber or even a red light. Um, so when I try cases, I like to, to, to try them in, in the context of common sense. Ladies and gentlemen, just don't take these folks' word for it. Use your own judgment and your own common sense. What, would, what likely happened here? Would somebody really be at a red light and then suddenly just accelerate through the red light? I mean, that's not likely. So, um, and then possible use of experts. Again, the cost-benefit analysis here is critical, but uh, where you have no witnesses and the damages warrant it, perhaps an accident reconstructionist. Um, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go at, uh, into a whole lot of detail on some of the general negligence. These are just some things that you need to be aware of. That uh, you know, uh, we go through this in our recognizing subrogation webinar. But because automobile accidents are the most common third-party um, situation that we'll come to. It, it does warrant some reminder that, you know, obviously get a police report. <clears throat> and remember, the police report is not golden. Uh, my dad was a cop for 37 years, and I can tell you that the one thing they can't do is turn in a blank for a police report. They have to put something on there. And, they ha and oftentimes, they feel compelled to cite somebody. So um, just because your employee gets cited doesn't necessarily mean that that's the sit you know the golden or that that's the truth and, and police reports can be changed they can be supplemented uh, charges can be dropped um, but a police report obviously is a good first step and I would talk to the policeman they do not mind it especially if they're in the office um, and you can ask them about it you'll be surprised at how much they remember that isn't able to be put on a report that's that's designed to be digitally inputted somewhere for statistics and you know, those reports get harder and harder to read every year. Um, uh, examples of negligence, again, I mentioned earlier, um, I had a great case involving an employee who was traveling at about 5.50 in the morning. This was during the winter months down in Texas. And at, at about 68 miles an hour, ran into the back of a cement truck and was severely injured. Well okay, what possible subrogation could there be in a situation where your employee actually rear-ends um, the, the defendant? Uh, wouldn't the employee be at fault? Well, perhaps, but this is where we get to the, um, the hidden subrogation concept, the pebbles. Do the investigation because in that case, and again, it was a catastrophic loss, we determined that the cement truck, which had turned onto the highway, and it was a 65-mile-an-hour uh, state highway, um, in Texas, this is some years ago, uh, had turned onto the highway some 365 feet earlier, was still in second gear and doing about 17 miles an hour. For some reason, he was just taking his sweet time getting up to speed. In the rear of the vehicle were two two-and-a-half-inch taillights that were covered over by dried cement. Um, there were no street lights. There was no moon. Um, and literally, uh, you have a gentleman who the, the quickest he could see this party was when his headlights, and there were some uh, 43 feet. Uh, there was a measurement as to how far they were, were, were shining ahead of his vehicle. Uh, and, of course, he was contributorily negligent, but um, we did make a nice recovery in that case. 
a case in which we did the rear ending. So look for subrogation potential even in those cases where it might not otherwise seem apparent. Tail lights, brake lights not working. Um, I saw a gentleman, I witnessed an accident in which a gentleman without tail lights was rear-ended um, while the two vehicles were traveling on, on a county road here in Wisconsin. And I stopped and gave my name and everything. But um, the first thing that happens is the cops are going to come and oh, well, the tail lights aren't working because you rear-ended them. Well, no, that's not the case. At least there was a witness in that, that situation. And you can prove whether or not the lights were working, but again, you have to have some some uh, quick investigation. So these are all these are all some issues um, that that you should just be reminded to look at. In premises cases, we've talked a little bit about some of this um, slip and fall construction um, cases hazards. You document the condition, uh, photographs, measurements, witnesses. Um, take. Uh, perspective photographs, put uh, a pen or something down just to give people the, the understanding of scale. Uh, a sketch of the area goes a long way. You're not a graphic design artist, neither am I. Uh, but uh, if you have someone investigating for you, oftentimes they have some experience at it. Get a nice sketch, um, as much to scale as you can. Photograph any warning signs. Uh, timing is everything. You know How long was something there? In a slip and fall in a grocery store, uh, the key is notice. Notice, notice, notice. Any premises case, any slip and fall, they are notoriously difficult cases. But again, we're not looking, this isn't a seminar on how to subrogate the easy ones. We're, we, we want to focus on getting the subrogation in the cases in which they otherwise not, might not be um, easily recognized or pop out at you. So timing is everything. Prior complaints, other conditions. Um, you know, if you, sometimes there are complaints made to municipalities about um, conditions in, in neighboring businesses. And again, we get back to the possible need for an expert. If you have products cases, and we see a lot of them, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on products liability, um, and, and we could. I mean, I could spend this two hours just on products liability and how to uh, uh, investigate and subrogate products liability because they are the most overlooked area of subrogation. Um, it, we're getting better. I, I get a lot of files that come to me. What do you think about this case? Here's a, some photographs. <clears throat> we have a machine here that took the guy's hand off or um, some sort of a, a ladder failure. I mean, it's, people understand that if a product is involved in a loss, it might have some responsibility its manufacturer might have some responsibility. But understand that when the, when the issue is submitted to a jury, it's submitted as though that product is a living, breathing person. Uh, there is a box there that says the product, or actually we'll name the product the, the latter. So you, you, you want to um, go into these cases with the understanding that maybe an expert's required to look at um, the product. And just because there's a lot of negligence on the part of the employee does not absolve the product manufacturer. Again, think back to the slide with the drive through in McDonald's. Um, if, if you want to maximize your recovery, you're going to have to get your hands dirty on some of the cases that make you feel a little uncomfortable. Like, I feel a little slimy subrogating on this case because this guy just was not paying attention. And, um, you know, th those are difficult cases, and we will um, always be the first person uh, to tell you, look, I've looked at this case, and I don't think this is one that's going to be able to be handled cost effectively, either because of uh, the cost effectiveness of the potential recovery versus the time that's necessary, or because it's just a bad case. But you won't know just by looking at your paper file, because your paper file is going to be different than, than the actual um, claim that, that's out there when you actually get out there. And with regard to spoliation, um, on our website there is a, um, uh, a chart that shows the spoliation laws of all 50 states, whether you can have first party claims, third party claims, um, what the obligations are. The key when you think about spoliation is this, you just want to give the defendants Man, product manufacturer as much notice as possible and an opportunity to get in, um, just like you've had, 
to see the, the, the setting, what happened, and to preserve any evidence that uh, they may want to preserve that, so they can blame something other than their product. And that's all that spoliation is. And if you use common sense, giving notice and working with people reasonably, you shouldn't have any spoliation products. But you're going to often want to obtain and secure the product. Um, I have a warehouse in Texas where we have some cases pending. Uh, one of the items that I'm preserving right now is a, uh, a 1988 um, Mack tractor trailer. Um, it has <clears throat> a ton of miles on it, and it ran over somebody because of an air brake problem. The insured was going to get rid of it, did not want to preserve it, did not want to set it aside, so we bought it and got it at a very reasonable price, but given the nature of the injuries, this is a steal. And it's a great investment, and we'll probably <clears throat> be able to um, turn around and resell it when we're done. But right now, we have the evidence, and the plaintiff's attorney is beholden to us. Give me one second. So when it comes time to, it, to argue attorney's fees on that case, the judge is going to go, holy cow, you bought the truck and preserved it, and that's what made the plaintiff's case. I think you, we can take some of those fees away because it really wasn't all of the plaintiff's work which benefited the comp carrier. It was subrogation counsel and, and the carrier itself which, which, um, which did that. <clears throat> you want to get a good statement of the operator of any uh, machinery. Um, find out how the machine works. If you understand how it works and what the routine is for operating it, um, then they will too. Uh, and then you'll, you'll be able to, um, uh, we'll be able to explain it to the jury a lot better and you'll be able to understand what, where you're headed in your investigation. Uh, we had a catastrophic injury involving a large Caterpillar 550, one of these giant front end loaders where the tires are almost as tall as I am. And um, we literally went out to <clears throat> uh, here in Wisconsin and found a dealer who had those and paid them to instruct us on how to operate those caterpillars. And that gave me a great in, uh, perspective on precisely how this injury could have or this accident could have happened. And we came up with our theory that way. And then we got our experts involved and um, were able to turn that into into a nice recovery. When you're out there, find out who manufactured it, where it was purchased. Um, get, uh, find out if there are any modifications, repairs, or maintenance. Who did it? If there's an operator or a service manual, you want to get that. They're happy to make copies of that stuff for you. <clears throat> we had a bad uh, case involving a, a small utility tire that exploded. Uh, literally, the, the rim exploded and uh, nearly took off someone's head. Uh, in an accident, and um, we went out and looked at the compressors, which did not have any um, variable controls on them, and uh, got the manuals, and were able to figure out quickly how it operated and what warnings were given. Um, uh, you want to engage an expert, um, and and do so as I've described, getting the right expert in the right geography, the right part of the country for the right price. And then, even then, you want to tell him, I do not want a written report. One of the mistakes we make is we get an expert, and then we tell him, well, I've got to justify the uh, $2,600 I spent on you to my boss, so please give me a nice written report. And he does so, and it comes all packaged, all nice and everything. But the problem is that um, that report uh, will hang you uh, later on, because when more facts are discovered and more evidence is unveiled, uh, that expert has now committed himself to a particular opinion without the benefit of significant facts that he would like to have had before he gave that opinion. And one of the questions I asked uh, when I cross-examine experts is, now isn't that something significant that you would like to have known before you made your opinion? Uh, and the answer has to be yes. So choose your expert carefully. Um, pr product liability, again, I I'm going to leave this here just um, just quickly uh, to give you some idea that, that product manufacturers have an obligation to manufacture a product that is not unreasonably dangerous. And uh, most jurisdictions use the consumer contemplation um, test, which is essentially if the average reasonable consumer would not realize that uh, by operating a Black & Decker drill, it could uh, 
and by hitting um, something hard with it that it could explode in your hands and uh, send shrapnel into your eye. I mean, that, that is an unreasonably dangerous condition, and understanding that and hiring an expert with design experience who can um, <clears throat> come up with a reasonable alternative design for you and not get struck by the courts is, is important. Um, here are some things to remember uh, and, and look into when you're, when you're investigating construction accidents. Um, these are um, some things that, that really get into the legal end of, of subrogation. Uh, you want to look on the contracts, get a copy of any contracts or agreements. We're looking for indemnity, waiver, uh, statutory employer defenses. You want to really document the conditions well. Uh, borrowed servant issues are important here. Ask questions about who you were doing work for at the time, who had the right to control the details of your work. Um, again, experts help out here, and uh, we can certainly help you in those cases. <clears throat> We've talked about some of this. Uh, you, it may not hurt to, to hire a, uh, a shade tree mechanic. What I mean by that is, is a guy with the word Bob written on his shirt. He doesn't have a PhD, but he certainly knows his way around a, uh, you know, a 2004 uh, Lincoln. And these are experts that may help you very inexpensively understand your case. He may not be the expert we take to trial. He might be, depending on the issues that we have to have him testify to. Uh, the, the problem with shade tree mechanics, of course, is <clears throat> they may know their stuff, and even some of the expensive experts do not, uh, but he may not have the talent of testifying. And, Half of the expert's quality is whether he can testify. I won't name names, but one of the best defect, uh, tire defect experts in the country, and I do a lot of tire um, defect litigation, uh, one of the best experts in the country, it, it, it literally is the best expert, is awful at testifying. He cannot string sentences together. He gets angry. He gets defensive. Um, he loses his train of thought when he testifies. He's brilliant otherwise. That's probably a mark of brilliance. He's like an idiot savant. But I, I, I can't use him in cases because if I have to go to trial, I have to have someone who will testify. Um, and again, if you have a question about whether or not you want to hire an expert, you can check with us. Uh, experts now have to meet some, some rather stringent criteria. And um, we want to uh, make sure that we get the right experts. We've talked a lot about statements. Um, I, I would say the number one tip that I have is to make sure you have a checklist. Um, there are checklists out there that, depending on the nature of the loss that you're investigating, always give the witness a chance to add or change his statement. Get him to sign it if it's a significant case, and we want that uh, testimony uh, for later on, or you think we are going to go to subrogation. Uh, always ask him if it's true and correct and to the best of his recollection. Uh, and these are things that we say so that he can't later, once he's been contacted by someone else, try and change um, his, his testimony. We talked about the work product privilege <clears throat> already. And, and using that, one of the tips I have is in order to protect your all of your investigation, <clears throat> is all, all you have to do is, be, is do it in anticipation of litigation. That's the key in almost every state. And I would say that it behooves you, whenever you put on your subrogation cap after taking off your claims handling cap, put a file in the memo, I mean, put a memo in the file, and say something to the effect of, we think there's subrogation potential here. We are going to investigate this in anticipation of subrogation litigation. And make sure it's dated. Just stick it in the file, or even in your activity log, of course, is what we do now. Uh, and then I can use that. <clears throat> When it comes time to protecting your work product, and this not only works if it's good and we want to use it and hold it hostage and barter with it, but also if it's bad and someone else wants to get it, then I can protect it so it doesn't get turned over to defense counsel who might want to use it to destroy your, your subrogation file. Um, so work product privilege is significant. Evidence preservation and spoliation, again, we, we talked about the fact that um, you, you don't want to do anything destructive. If you're out there, I've seen cases where the investigator or even the claims uh, handler is out to doing some investigation, and uh, they try and take something apart. <clears throat> I'll tell you, that's like a magnet for spoliation claims. The minute something's apart, 
the other side then sits down and they put their thinking cap on and try and come up with some way that they can blame um, what you did on not being able to um, uh, investigate properly and the fact that it's destroyed some potential for them to come up with the real cause of the, uh, the accident as opposed to the one that, that we are, are um, coming up with. Um, the, the photograph you see there is an actual case. This was right on the border of Illinois and Wisconsin. It was a skipper butts. Um, this happened to be a property loss. It could have easily been an injury case. One guy had smoke inhalation and had a small comp loss, but this was a case in which there were probably some $50 million in boats, including uh, exotic uh, wood teak yachts that were being stored for the winter here. Um, uh, just a tremendous beautiful boats that were just total loss. And <clears throat> what we had is we had Skipper Buds, the insured, in there um, shoveling through the evidence to try and find a, a space heater that they think might have been the cause of the accident. And so we had significant spoliation that we had to deal with. So um, th that's just, it's an issue to be aware of. Um, real quickly, I'm going to just and this is significant because this can be a, a, a case killer. Whenever a government is involved, if you think um, the state, federal, county, um, local town governments are, are somehow responsible, um, <clears throat> understand that governments are generally immune from liability unless we give notice and make a claim for damage. Now, this is Wisconsin law, and the law is different. Like I said, in Texas, and I handle a lot of litigation in Texas, um, each state has their own sta uh, each city has their own city charter, and they each have different dates. Like I said, Austin can be 30 days, San Antonio 90, Houston's 120. You have to give notice within a relatively short period of time. In Wisconsin, you have to um, give notice to the plaintiff's attorney, to third-party carriers. And, and to claimants, but if you put the government on notice and it's the state, you have to make um, um, a notice of claim under 893.82 and you do not have to give a separate notice of injury. The notice of claim has to follow statutory protocol. You simply sending a letter out and saying, uh, state of Illinois, we think you're responsible for this, your driver driving the, uh, um, the state uh, county dump truck rear-ended our guy it may not be sufficient. It has to follow specific statutory requirements. If it's non-state, if it's county, um, cities, towns, school districts, uh, metros, um, you have to file a notice of injury and a claim for damages, and both have to be complied with. And if they're not, um, there are problems. There are specific requirements. <clears throat> you have to serve the um, the uh, claim by certified mail, um, and in some cases you have to serve it just like you would serve a lawsuit. So again, simply because you send out notice doesn't mean that that notice um, is adequate. And I, and I tell you this because understanding that each state has a specific set of rules like this, and this of course is Wisconsin, means that um, you know you have to give a final dollar amount, which is hard in a comp case. So you have to come up with an estimate, and um, you know I just recommend overshooting. And then um, you can have uh, a certain amount of days in which the government will deny your claim, and only then can you file suit. And there are some exceptions with motor vehicles where they have actual notice. Um, I, I just. I've added some things to your um, your handout about a ref referral of file, files to Matisse and Wickert and Lair. Uh, I, I say that only because we are doing now most of our work electronically, um, and it's really you can send files electronically, and we've gone a great deal of expense to take larger files that come through uh, through the internet through email. And there's a file referral form here that uh, is a sample that gives us a lot of information. This isn't just for referring files. If you have a case in which you are curious about subrogation potential, we, do, we will be happy to review the file. Like I said, this is the only webinar in which I'm going to um, uh, conclude these slides. And the reason I do it is because investigation is often <clears throat> going to be a team effort. 
And, uh, you know, I consider myself part of the team. We here at Matisse and Wicker consider ourselves part of the team. There is some investigation which um, is, is going to be worthy of being done by a, a trial lawyer who will be trying that actual case. And um, so it's important to, uh, to do that and to always, when you're out there investigating, think subrogation, which I think we now know means not only understanding the facts, investigating the facts, but also investigating the law and understanding that the law will actually lead you to and be a roadmap for what it is that you need to investigate. Um, uh, and so with that, I, we do have a few questions. I'm going to take uh, a few minutes and answer um, started the question, uh, some of the questions. Um, Army Turner, is it possible to send email updates on cases that are examples of unseen subrogation or opportunities for subrogation? Uh, yes, it is. Um, if you are attending this webinar, you will ultimately be on our mailing list for the uh, newsletter. We try to do that, um, and uh, you know, I part of part of what I've realized I've done for myself is uh, three or four hours of my day is spent updating and, and keeping up with the law, uh, with with some of these books, and it's it's a worthwhile endeavor. And I actually do a lot of it at night, uh, but we we will endeavor to do more of that because these are the cases. This is the iceberg, the part of the iceberg you don't see. The cases that we're talking about here. Um, uh, Richard Kershey, hi Rich, how are you? Um, wasn't part of the defense that McDonald's coffee was not meant to be drank in the car, but taken home, giving it time to cool. You know, great, great point, Rich. And yeah, and I, I tell you that comes from somebody with years of <laughs> defense background. Um, and and and, that, and that's not a slight to you, Rich. It's a great question, and yes, that is part of the defense. But here's the thing: you can tell somebody to buy Q-tips, and on it says, "Look, don't put inside your ear." Um, but that simply is a self-serving legal disclaimer by which the, the lawyers hope that one day, if they're ever sued, they can say, well, we told you not to put it in your ear, so you shouldn't have punctured your eardrum. Everyone knows that when you, when you drink coffee, people are traveling, um, consumers drink it in their car. Regardless of what they say it's for or what it's intended for, the consumer expectation, again, getting back to that uh, concept, and, and if you, if you, those of you who want to attend, um, I'm not sure. I don't have the schedule in front of me. When we do our Recognizing Subrogation Seminar, we'll get into the nitty-gritty on this. Um, but it's a great point, Rich. Yes, they did, and McDonald's did defend that case, saying you're not supposed to drink it in the car. Um, but one of the misconceptions in that case was that, oh, she's driving down the road, driving with her knee, trying to undo the coffee. No, no, that's not at all what happened. Uh, and I want to say this, too. I'm not positing the McDonald's hot coffee case as, well, this is this is the kind of case we want to go pursue all the time. It is a great example for two reasons. It's an, it's an example of aggressively pursuing the unseen subrogation, and it's also a case in which I have personal intimate knowledge on uh, because my friend tried it. Um, so, and that's, that's kind of why I use it. I also use it because it's one of those head turners where you go, what? He's going to use that as a, an example of uncovering subrogation potential? Um, uh, John, uh, John M. has a question. What is the best way to protect an uh, investigation conducted by an insurance company or its investigator from being subject to a subpoena or discovery? Um, here's a rule. If you get a subpoena, call me. Uh, and the reason I say that is this. If you get a subpoena, it means someone else is out there looking at these facts with an eye towards suing somebody, which means there's money to be recovered that you may or may not be getting part of. Um, <clears throat> This question may have been sent before I talked about this, but remember I said put that memo in your file? If you put that memo in your, in your file, 99 times out of 100, we control whether, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have in that file is um, revealed to a, um, a crafty defense lawyer somewhere down the road. Um, there's another question here. Sandra asks, uh, when giving notice to government entity, should a subrogated carrier give notice in the name of the insured (parentheses claimant, close parentheses) or the insurance company's name? Um, good question. Um, the answer is submit the claim notice on behalf of, uh, let's say, your society, society insurance company, as subrogee of injured claimant. Insert his name. 
So Society Insurance Company is subrogate of Bob Schmidt. Um, <clears throat> that's because although you're technically subrogated to the rights of the injured employee, you, uh, you may be the one prosecuting the case. You don't necessarily know that the claimant's going to be prosecuting it. Spell out your obligations and the payments you made as well as your subrogation reserves. Because remember, when you're giving notice to the government, and only the government gets away with this, they will say, well, you can give us notice, but the only thing you're going to be able to recover from us is that dollar amount that you put in that notice claim. And that's true in most states. So if you put down our lien is 12000 and then six years later the lien is $1.2 million, um, you're limited to recovering 12000 So put down worst-case scenario. Spell out that you're paying daily benefits, weekly benefits, and spell out that the medical is going to grow, and throw a large number in there and say that this is what we think we're going to um, have to pay. Uh, <clears throat> Bob, Robert Thompson uh, asks, we have one expert that we are supposed to use for everything. Does that lead to problems? Um, uh, Robert, I, I think hopefully you heard my, uh, my solilo soliloquy on that. Uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, it will lead to problems. And that, that is going to only increase as courts get more strict about keeping junk science out of litigation. Uh, again, part of the problem that, that we have with subrogation is that um, uh, guys, I'll use a quick example. Uh, in, in New Jersey, there is a new bill in New Jersey. Um, it was voted 75 to nothing to approve legislation to, it's a subrogation destroying bill. Um, it was, uh, it's on the Governor Christie's desk, and uh, I, I have to probably say Governor Christie has um, kind of asked for our input on, on what we think about it, which shows some, some thinking on his part. It was sponsored by Republicans. Now, I'm not going to get political, but understanding that we have a problem as subrogation professionals because subrogation is looked at, as we talked early on, as, as being, this is the, the, the mother of all frivolous lawsuits, is these, these needless subrogation suits that get filed out there, taking money away. The, the trial lawyers say we're taking money away from the injured claimants. The, the, uh, the, uh, the tort reform crowd is saying, well, it just crowds the courts. We don't need all these subrogation lawsuits. Nobody's thinking about the value. Uh, of these suits, and um, um, so we there, there's an example in in New Jersey about um, the fact that we're f battling things on on all sides. So I'm, I actually got a little bit off track. Uh, does your firm handle investigation of claims as well as the subrogation um, aspect of claims? Um, yes, we do. I mentioned earlier that we have a program for doing that. I don't recommend the program for for you know s smaller files. Um, because, <clears throat> I mean, we do a, a great job, but it does take some time. Um, but if you have large losses or losses which you are going to have large reserves, I would heavily recommend it as opposed to simply sending out um, the same guy you send out on, on the, uh, you know, the, the $200 uh, traffic accident cases. Uh, here's a good question. <clears throat> Connie in Texas asks, is workers' compensation subrogation a statutory lien or a right of subrogation? Uh, we, do we need to conduct an investigation on our own? Won't plaintiff's attorney do this for us? Um, yeah, sure, the plaintiff's attorney will do it, and he'll charge you for it. Uh, you'll get a bill at the end of the day for one-third of your lien. Um, uh, you, you, you do have a, a statutory lien in almost every state. Uh, you, do not have a, you do not have a right of subrogation in every state, but you do in most states. So um, it, it just depends on what state you're in. Again, this is what makes what we do um, so complicated. Um, uh, Greg Haskins, I have a claim for a guy who works for our insured community sewer and septic. They got a job for the county fire department to repair a dry hydrant. There was an electric box and he was unaware of it at the time, but there was an exposed wire coming out of the box. He was using a shovel and a rubber handle to dig around the box. It was city land and his shovel came into contact with the wire and he sustained an electric shock. How would you pursue sever on this case? Is a municipality involved? Um, Greg, I'll tell you what, the answer is maybe and maybe. Um, I, I will send you an email on that because I, that's going to take uh, a little bit more time than I think we have here today. Um, uh, and let's see, there's one more question here. Oh, there, well, actually, oh God, there's a whole page. I'm going I'm to get some of these questions back to you via email so I'm not holding everybody up. Uh, here's another question. We have a big problem with our insureds, employers being uncooperative and actually hurting our third-party cases. In one recent case, 
The plaintiff's attorney dropped the case because they wouldn't cooperate. Uh, cooperate. How can we avoid this? Uh, great question, and it illustrates the point that I was making early in the webinar that investigation serves another purpose other than investigating and preserving and, and uh, creating a, a bedrock for your subrogation case. And that is, it also, you, you are out there politicking. It's important to get to the employer in almost every case and explain what subrogation is, what you're going to be doing, why you're going to be doing it, how it benefits them, how they can't be sued. Um, in Illinois and in Minnesota, I have a nice speech for, for insureds because you have potential contribution claims there. Um, and there are some states where the employer's negligence will actually hurt um, <clears throat> the plaintiff's recovery or hurt the subrogation recovery, depending on where you're at. Um, and it's important, I think, to get to the employers and, first of all, proselytize to them as to why you're doing this, how it helps them, how it's going to save them money. Secondly, uh, there is, in many states, a, uh, an implied obligation and a three-party um, um, uh, triumvirate, if you will, where, where the employer, the employee, and the work comp carrier all have privity and are part of uh, the workers' compensation claim, and there is a duty of reciprocal uh, responsibility and cooperation between the three of them. And for states that don't have that, there is in most comp policies uh, a cooperation clause. I love to copy that. Actually, I have a throwdown page that I send out. I have no idea if it's the same <clears throat> as in their policy, but I send it out anyway. Um, there is a clause that basically says that uh, there is a duty of cooperation. And um, so I have some other questions here. I see there's another long one that I would like to um, respond to in some more detail, but I am fairly um, adamant about not going over by more than 12 minutes, which is what I've done. So I would like to thank you for, um, for your attendance. I don't have the next webinar uh, handy to announce, but it will be going out in our newsletter, which I think will be going out tomorrow, so you will all get that. Thanks for your attendance, and have a blessed day. Thank you.